Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for attending this session about how to become more relevant and how to increase your value to your customer. A friend of mine, Andrew Bird, is, uh, I've, been, I've been working with him for oh, 12, 13 years now. We, uh, we work for a South African uh, Cisco partner uh, here in uh, Melbourne, Australia. And uh, we've taken in sales in the and we are keep up every year, and, uh, and and it's amazing how the journey becomes such a small world. Now, this presentation is a little bit different than normal because uh, we we're in an industry that is uh, that is very commoditized, and, and everybody knows how to buy a box and sell it. And and the problem is, and I've and I've really learned this over the COVID period, is that more people are tending to buy a box and sell it, try to make money and fight to the bottom, but nobody's really asking the questions. What does that box do for your customer? So if you're not asking those questions, I can guarantee that a competitor of yours is. And so what Andrew's been doing is trying to help I suppose, businesses like me or even up to uh, medium enterprise customers uh, understand the relevance of infrastructure to ICT strategy and the value that you are already as a trusted supplier to that customer itself. A lot of people I find are just too scared to ask the questions or a lot of people are also a little bit, uh, probably a little bit lazy trying to understand uh, the questions to ask. So the way that I've learned success in business is by understanding what it is, is your relevance. And uh, and hopefully this this presentation that Andrew will put forward and and please ask questions uh, throughout the uh, the session. Um, it's, it's just about opening up a little bit more on what you, what you want to do when we can't actually physically see people that want to buy from us. But when we don't really understand our relevance in their organisation, what collateral can we uh, can we help you with to uh, to to you know step up that uh, that value chain and, and you know build your revenue back up, build your profit up, and not become a, a problem of fighting to the bottom when anybody can do what you do if you're just selling a box. So I'll hand it over to Andrew uh, to kick it off, and uh, thanks for coming on board. Thank you, Brett. Thank you for the context and the introduction. And I've I've been listening from the start of the the um, the presentations and. Just reflecting from from Joe, uh, Neil, and Todd, and and really really wonderful to hear some of the themes around you know becoming a trusted partner and what that actually means in the real world. Uh, Neil was talking about the code of ethics, uh, and in the context of this audience and then broader business. So it it um it really in the context of what we're going to be talking about now. I enjoyed thinking about you know be, becoming a trusted partner, and as Brett has talked about. You know, there's there's been some big changes in our world the last 18 months, and uh, both Brett and I are based in, in Melbourne. And, and as Brett clearly highlighted, we've been in lockdown for far too long. I think uh, uh, one of the one of the longest lockdowns, as as you mentioned, Brett. Uh, so there there has been a lot of unknowns for us, for for businesses generally, and infrastructure providers, technology providers, and I think there's that's going to continue into next year and beyond. Uh, we we look at that probably trying to find a bit of a, 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 a silver lining to it. Uh, I think the world has got a bit smaller, and I think the, this event is testament to that, that some of the customers of Foundstone are working with perhaps the borders of travel, et cetera, previous years, but now it's really opened up. I think a forum is just testament to this, so I want to congratulate you all um, for putting it together. And I enjoyed Corey, Corey's presentation just before talking about standards and certifications in particular, circular economy, and how that can relate, a line that Corey and Joe were, were talking about at the end were, is how do we earn the right for customers' business? So I think it leads nicely on to, to Brett's context and the topic today is about how do we become more relevant to our end customers? And the work that Foundstone do, we're a, we're a business advisory, uh, my background is from the technology space. We'll go into that in a second. So we want to be digging into this a bit more, more detail and at a very grassroots level. We, we're not the typical uh, advisory that just looks at frameworks. We have some frameworks, but we really, really look at digging into how that applies in the real world. And the conversations with Brett and Joe prior to this um, have been really interesting to hear about the, the uh, association helping you as members to do that. So hopefully... Today, this conversation will help you ask some of those questions of your own business. So just a, a bit about myself. 
the mugshot here. So as Brett mentioned, we've known each other for about 15 years. We both worked for Dimension Data, a, uh, a global-ish uh, systems uh, provider. Uh, we were based in the Melbourne office, of course. So I've been involved with systems integration uh, technology and digital for, for over 20 years. So originally in the context of uh, business development consulting within systems integration space, um, to then the last probably five, five to 10 years, moving more into that digital and uh, business strategy consulting space. And I think what, what we've seen over the years, some of the, some of the main changes is, you know, moving to, from that pro, just that pure product perspective to what is the broader solution that we can actually fit into? And Joe, Joe reminded me when we caught up originally, you know, we're not just trying to sell products, we're trying to sell an overall solution. And I think the, the association from what I've seen is testament to that, that, you know, now you have, you know, people from all over the globe, US, Japan, South Africa. And I think that the, the forum is testament to what that can enable in terms of building that overall solution. So, Brett, you know, you mentioned just briefly, you know, 15 years ago, um, Dimension Data SI, and we we look at that 15 years. That there's been a lot of change, but there are there are still some similar principles, aren't there? That's correct. Um, everybody, I look, the principles are really uh, changing in the way that the the space that is infrastructure has been, I would say, confused a little bit as to what is cloud, uh, what is uh, what is infrastructure versus what is software. And it becomes a little bit, uh, I suppose, of a playground where people that say they want to move to cloud create a perception that those in the infrastructure uh, space uh, become less relevant. Reality is that nobody really understands what cloud is because everybody has a different uh, interpretation. Cloud's really, you know, if you've got an iPhone, you, you connect to the cloud. If you have a Office 365 account, you connect to the cloud, whether it's public, private, whatever. But what people fundamentally forget is that to get to the cloud, they need infrastructure. And I think that everything has got to come back down to how do you pass the packet? How do you provide the plumbing? Whether that's mm -hmm. in networking or whether that's in, uh, in storage, whether that's in service. And as soon as you realise that, you also understand that you've got uh, the, the right to, uh, you've got a customer that already trusts you. So why can't you change the conversation with what you do? Without your infrastructure, nothing up the top of the stack happens. And that's why I think it's uh, you know not just selling kit anymore and, and many services. It's about the whole it's about the whole journey of, uh, of the sales cycle for enterprise. So I think that's what I've learned in business, especially for the last eight years. It was very easy to make good money off moving boxes, but that's not what is anymore. Um, COVID's made it a lot harder, and anybody who's a keyboard warrior can compete for the same box for the same uh, same customer uh, and fight to the bottom if price is your only differentiator. So it's about changing that conversation, Andrew. Love it. And, and I know in the conversations we've had over the years that I, I see that firsthand in the way, you know, you do business and you talk about the association, Joe and the team, et cetera. And I think, you know, you're you're helping change that mindset across the industry. So full commendation to you all. So this is a high level approach we'll be taking today. Uh, Rogers and Bird, it either sounds like a law firm or a, or a comedy skit. So we'll, we'll let you be the judge. And as, and as Brett mentioned, we're happy to take questions throughout. So I think Brett's going to keep an eye on the, on the comments and any Q&A coming in here. Um, so we're happy to take them as we go through. Uh, design thinking is, is something that we, we uh, turn to a bit in our, in our business strategy practice. We're certainly not purists in the terms of, you know, we, we die by a certain framework. But we, we're going to be touching on some of the, some, some of the principles of design thinking and how we we see that they can be pretty helpful either as a business owner or as a as a in management level or an architectural or a technical level how that some of those design thinking principles can help in the way we think and position overall solutions so i'm going to we're going to share a few real life examples of that um, in terms of as brett mentioned we're going to have a conversation about moving from product commodity to partnership and the fact that we don't have to have all the answers in our business strategy consulting Many years ago, I, I had the perception that a lot of our customers wanted us to have all the answers. And, and that's, that's true to a degree, but what we are seeing out there now, that people are wanting an open conversation with partners 
They're wanting their partners to, to, to start those and in, in invest in those conversations from a very early stage. And we see that is then bringing the fruits of investment and overall um, mind share and product share, uh, and which relates to the bottom line that we see that could be relevant to yourselves in the infrastructure space. And then we're going to finish with some, some questions there if we get a, get a chance to do that. So just moving on, um, I think Brett's already covered a bit of that in terms of the changing dynamics in the market. I'd say that I'd certainly agree with that. I'd say that the changes that Brett and I have seen in the systems integration space, and I um, I noticed there was a, a few dialing in from South Africa, so you know, Dimension Data, a big South African company, and I, I'd be fairly certain that those principles don't change around the globe. And um, even listening to Corey in terms of standards and certifications, when we're talking about security standards, but for example, 27,001. I liked how Corey positioned that because we're thinking about that as a standard, but what does that standard actually mean to us? And how can we relate that to our end customer? So from what we see from a business strategy and then relating it to an infrastructure world, it's those partners that can look at the market dynamics. There's so many, there's still so many unknowns, COVID's still in play around the world. So I think it's the partners um, that can actually look at what's happening in the broader context of the market, relate that to their own business, and then translate that in pretty clear terms of what that means to their end customer are going to be out, going to be coming out ahead. So we're going to be hopefully covering that those that that setting of the scene in a few examples. Strategy ideation. So strategy ideation again at risk of using a buzz term. Ideation is a, is a pretty key pr principle to design thinking. And essentially what ideation is, as opposed to perhaps the conventional model that we have to have the perfect solution before we launch, or we have to have the, the perfect product set before we take that to a customer, we're putting pretty much flipping that on, on its head and saying we can start the other way around. So this is just a bit of, bit of a simple uh, framework diagram that I think will will hopefully paint a bit of a picture of what we're seeing in this space and how it can relate to you know yourselves as business owners or people within infrastructure um, providers. One of the biggest things that we see is that um, most providers and businesses automatically want to jump into the solution mode but we're saying start and reverse. Um, spend as much time as we can as possible defining what is the real problem. We, we see that often organizations, and I'm going to be talking to an example in a minute, can think perhaps they, they are solving the right problem that's going to have the biggest impact. But when they spend their time with their custom base and their market, they can realize that there's probably a better, better and bigger problem to be solving. The next part of what we see is, you know, we want to be focused on working with our customers to be investing in helping them build prototypes. And I think what we're seeing in the infrastructure space and business strategy space is that when partners are willing to invest in helping building out prototypes at that very early stage, that de-risks for our customers and it also builds that relationship and trust from an early stage. Then when we're moving to a minimal viable product, it's a concept that you might be familiar with um, the, the lean um, startup process and design thinking. And a minimal viable product is essentially when it get when a product gets to a stage where it's where it's viable enough to launch in a test market so in the, in perhaps in the conventional older days rolling out large scale applications and products we wanted to wait for three years the waterfall project to get it perfect but what we're seeing now in business and in the product world that we're wanting to to get to a stage of just a minimal viable product to launch and then learn from and then last, but very much not least, is technology platforms. And this is really at the heart of what the forum is, as I understand with the association and what, what Brett has talked about um, and, and uh, Corey as a, as a previous presenter. I think so often uh, we get perhaps caught up with focusing on our solution and what our solution can do from the customer up front. But what we're seeing is that if we can spend as much amount of time in getting as early as possible into helping our customer def define the problem and identify the right problem, it has huge advantages for us as infrastructure providers. Now, I'm going to talk to an example, and then I think Brett might have a couple of questions. Uh, there was an example. We were working with a customer here in Australia, the Royal Australian College of GPs. 
So they're a, a member organization. They have about 40,000 members that uh, serve, um, you know, 40,000 plus general practitioners, uh, doctors across Australia. They've been pretty busy at this time, as you can imagine. Uh, we worked with the college um, uh, for, for a number of years. We, we originally started with their head of technology uh, and they came to us saying that, you know, they, the business came to them saying, we want you to help uh, us roll out this application to solve a certain uh, significant problem in the industry. Now, the industry problem was around solving some significant issues around mental health and obesity in the healthcare sector. So two pretty significant areas. And the IT team at RACGP was originally asked to say, we want you to go and build this application. You've got six months to do it, and it has to be launched and rolled out and ready to go. Uh, when, when, when the head of IT from RACGP came to us, we said, well, do, do we first know what is the problem this application is going to solve at a fairly granular level? And through a number of conversations, we realized that we didn't really have a good, good definition of that problem. So what we actually did, the IT team brought in a number of their infrastructure partners. They brought in application partners, as well as they actually brought in healthcare experts who were in the field that this end solution was going to hopefully solve the problems. And we had a number of sessions and forums in actually defining that problem. And what actually ended up happening, there was a couple of infrastructure providers that were part of that. They positioned themselves and they were willing to invest. They weren't experts in the healthcare problem, but the fact that they were involved in defining the actual business problem with the customer, they weren't experts in the healthcare problem, but it was one of the infrastructure providers that came up with a, a new way, a new frame to look at the problem, which changed the whole entire game for this customer. And long story short, that infra infrastructure then provider stepped up, they, they ended up winning the entire infrastructure platform it was a mix of refurbished. It was a mix of private cloud. And as Brett mentioned, you know, when we talk about cloud, define that, but we can, we can talk about that later on. So this infrastructure provider went from perhaps thinking that they were just going to be providing boxes initially to be, to be challenging and being part of that original problem definition conversation. They were then 10 steps ahead of the game. It went to tender, but they ended up winning the whole infrastructure provider. And they actually then grew their own business more into the application space. And they added on a part of a consulting part of their, their business they never thought of. So I hope that that just provides you a bit of a snapshot of what this can. That was a, probably a broad example. What this concept of ideation and the, the fact of investing uh, in the problem definition, the, the outcomes that can have. Brett, I don't know if you had any comments in terms of reflections of what you're seeing in your, in your space, you know, more directly to this. Yeah, look, um, I do want to make a couple of comments, and this is probably uh, based on experience that I had uh, working for a, a cloud company called VMware. This is going back about 10 years ago and how it's relevant to what we do today um, because I had a what I call like a bit of a oh shit experience where I was on new hire training. Uh, I was, uh, they flew me to Singapore. Uh, they put me up in a nice hotel. And they pulled me out of the audience in front of 350 of my colleagues from around the world. And I said, give me an, ele an elevator pitch to a taxi driver about cloud. So Love the situation it. is that I get picked up from Singapore, Changi Airport. Uh, I've got a, a gentleman asking, where have I come from? What am I doing? <laughs> and, uh, and he goes, who do you work for? And I say, I work for VMware. He goes, well, what do VMware do? And I said, well, we do cloud. And he goes, well, what's cloud? And, and, and to become relevant to a taxi driver when you're talking cloud, there's only one thing in that car, and that was his iPhone. So his iPhone is actually a cloud-connected device. He's got secure applications sitting on a secure device that is accessed from anywhere, anytime. And you know what? He can access those same applications on an IBM laptop. He can access those same applications on, uh, on, a, on a Mac or an iPad. Now... His version of cloud, he had no idea what it was, but he was using it. Then I start getting into other presentations here uh, in Australia. And every time I ask the question, you know, what's your definition of cloud? I've got a different answer every time. But what I learned about that is everybody's talking about it. Nobody really understands it. But what you continuously see when dealing with customers is they always take a top-down approach. They don't see the infrastructure that sits in the data center. Because I think it's out in the cloud. They don't see what's in the in the cupboards in the in the local 
you know, in, in their own comms room uh, because you know, who cares about it? It just works. But what they forget about, they make all these application and cloud decisions and forget about the poor guy that's got to stand up the network and the infrastructure to support it. So it's about the, the problem you, you need to continually address is that people want what they can see, and typically that's the application, that's the funky stuff that, uh, that, that provides new phones, new, you know, new applications on desktops, uh, ability to be more mobile. Mm. But you lose that discussion as to, well, what actually makes that happen? And so if you can make your infrastructure relevant, to the problem that they're addressing, which is at the top of the stack, neither works without either. And I think you can just, if you can learn how to have that conversation, you're, you're now selling value tied to a solution, not just a box to deliver an outcome. So, yeah. oh, that's, that's a brilliant example. On that. <laughs> no, it's a brilliant example because it's, it's a real life. And, you know, we're talking, you know, you use the example of VMware, so a big global brand. And then and actually relating to a person, you know, in that case, it was a taxi driver. Relating of what cloud and then you as an infrastructure provider means in their context. So I think a brilliant example. So just takeaways, and Brett and I were trying to make this as valuable as, as possible to you as the audience. So I think, you know, one of, the, one of those ones which we've covered a bit in terms of, you know, as an infrastructure provider, try to look at how you can be part of defining what the real problem is in the customer eyes. So that initially might not be, you know, you talking about your specific product or box, um, so broaden the conversation of how that could relate to the, the broader business problem they're trying to solve. And number two, simply don't devalue yourself. So as I've heard Brett talk about in that example there, you know, people can, can focus on the shiny end application space, but the critical infrastructure that this sits, sits on and the periphery infrastructure, infrastructure, data network security that sits on, that is just as important to maintain the longevity of that solution and to, to make sure it's up and running. And like the example I talked about, that infrastructure provided at the Royal Australian College of GPs, they they put their own solution aside for, for a minute in terms of that problem definition, and they were the ones that actually came up with, um, you know, one of the solving the industry problems, which helped to grow and expand their own business. And the last one, it links back to, you know, what Joe opened up, you know, the conference with, you know, becoming a trusted uh, partner. Neil talked about code of ethics. I think, you know... The way that what I heard from from both Joe and Neil is that you know code of ethics that is about how the association brings that that ethical those values to the broader community and what I've heard even so far and what I've heard Brett talk about in broader sense that that you know members are living and breathing that and I think there is a direct relationship between that and our bottom line so let, let's not forget that. Just wanted to cover just some principles again you know looking at design thinking and some of the work we do in business strategy uh i did, didn't want to get too airy fairy or conceptual here but i thought this could just provide some good practical uh insights when we when we talk to business owners in terms of shaping their business strategy we encourage them to start outside looking in inherently uh strategy or business strategy or strategy at a technology level can often say, well, you know, we turn to ourselves, we're putting the pressure on ourselves saying, we have to come up with the solution and answers. What we're seeing, even from the larger, you know, when you look at say, for example, Stanford um, College in the US, Stanford D School, um, uh, even McKinsey, they are shifting their perception to saying that as opposed to them being the experts and having the answers, start with that outside looking, outside looking in perspective. So relating that to yourselves as infrastructure providers, if you're able to start a conversation with some of your customers, simply open up the conversation of what is happening within their broader business and what are the issues that they're trying to solve, what you're actually doing is helping them open their minds to some of the bigger problems they can solve and ultimately then you can be a part of. So it's a pretty simple principle. We, we, we say it pretty powerful. And it goes towards that there, are, there is going to be, uh, there's still a lot of unknowns in the market, uncertainty. By starting with that outside looking in perspective, it helps us to navigate and get a real read of what's happening from a very dynamic perspective on the market. So we can be nimble in shifting our messaging, our marketing, our sales and our conversations with the market. And again, it comes back to, um, in all our conversations, we want to be closest to that end problem. We, we use the term, you know, start with, start with the people closest to the end problem. So in, in your conversations as providers, is, is, 
if you can open up your customer's eyes to perhaps a problem in their customer's world they never saw, the insight you can bring in the relationship to that is significant. This is just a, just a high level framework in terms of when we look at, you know, on, on the left hand sides in the market, we've got still got lots of ambi ambiguity, lots of unknowns, um, potential regulation changes. And then on the right, how do we actually add value and get, get a clarity around that? And there's a term in design thinking, uh, it's called co-creation. And, and again, it can be a bit of a buzz term, but what that actually means is, as opposed to coming to customers and saying, we've got the solution or the answer, it's saying collectively, we might not have, have all the solutions. Collectively, we might, know, we might not know what exact problem we wanna solve. But let's, let's look at this together and have the right conversations and forums. And I think you know, the example of, of the, um, the, the association itself, you know, you, you are all bringing things together to essentially float these industry significant problems. Corey talked about the circular economy um, and you know, looking at sustainability and standards. I think that an example, you'll, you'll start, you're doing that very much. So I would continue to continue that because out of that co-creation, we start to distill what's really important for yourselves and for your end customers. This is just a, a high level, uh, you know, way that we can look at, uh, you know, distilling down those, you know, those sp specific problems. Essentially, you know, starting really wide, again, not falling into the trap of saying, okay, this is a specific problem or solution that we want to offer. Um, customer, uh, client personas is a term that's used in design thinking. What that is, you might have heard it before. It essentially is taking a moment just to step back and saying, "What are what am I? Who are my typical customers, and what are they experiencing? What are they what are they thinking and feeling and saying within their own businesses, and their own market? And then how can we how can we help them respond to those challenges? Customer journey maps. I'll show you a very basic example at the in, in a minute. Is essentially is putting ourselves in our customers' shoes and saying. When the big, when the customer when our customer becomes aware that we exist, what is the typical process that they have with our organisation? And when we take a bit of time to do that, what normally bubbles up is we we begin to see some of the the major issues or the touch points that we can improve in our own process. Blueprints is about how can we you know get those really decent ideas that we can roll out to the market, and then of course getting a technical baseline that is. With us as in infrastructure providers, when we're looking at it from that perspective, how do we how do we you know blend that into the mix of solving the the, the the most significant problem for customers? These are just a couple of examples. This is a customer from a large global insurance provider, and this is an example that we had a whole heap of different providers in the room, a couple of infrastructure providers similar to a lot of yourselves uh, on the call, and again um, the infrastructure providers. This is what a, a, to to brainstorm a large, um, an application for a large health insurer. And the two infrastructure providers who were part of that, they invested their time with, although they weren't experts in the sector or, or the application, they invested their time and they became ingrained in the overall problem, defining the problem and solution. It changed the whole perception from the customer of what they were doing as providing. And they ended up getting the whole infrastructure solution in, in the end as well. This is a very, very, very basic example of a customer journey map. Customer journey maps you can do, you can spend days on. This is an example of what we work with a customer in the tech, in their, their infrastructure and tech provider. In helping them, it was with their CEO and some of their directors and putting themselves in the shoes of their customers. And we did this literally within an hour to say, what are the major touch points that your customers are having with your, your organization? Um, and what are, the, what are the potential pain points? What are the areas that we can really improve on? And we find that this basic process can help us really pinpoint the things that we can have the most impact uh, with our own organization. This is a bit of an interesting line, and it's a line that resonates with a lot of, a lot of CEOs and boards and uh, uh, execs that we work with. And it's the fact that, we, that we, can, we can steer away from trying to be the smartest person in the room mindset. And you might look at that and you say, well, what, what on earth has that got to do with me running my business or, or in the infrastructure space, whether it be from an architect, a technical, technical perspective. But the way we look at that is a lot of us put, out, put pressure on ourselves, running our own business, or it could be a solution, 
with, with putting pressure to saying, I have to have all the answers. And what we're finding, it's shifting, even with the large global consultancies, the likes of McKinsey, the larger schools across the world, to again, flipping, as I mentioned before, it is as instead of feeling like we have to have the answers, to flip that on its head and say, we might have a few ideas here, but let's have this forum and conversation with our customers and with their customers to work out what, what the best approach can be. And we find that by just shifting that mindset and, and, you know, Brett talked about, you know, don't, you know, don't devalue ourselves and saying, well, you know, we might be providing the boxes and infrastructure, but we can still have a seat at the table for those larger business problem conversations. And I think we all, well, I know I've been pleasantly surprised in the customers we work with and my own personal experience. When we take that mindset that we don't have to be and just start that conversation, uh, a lot of good things can happen. This is just a quote, uh, a, bit, uh, a bit corny, at the risk of being corny, from a famous, famous guy, pretty smart guy, as we'd probably all acknowledge. And I think it just it just goes about highlighting that, you know, someone, you know, the smartest mind is Albert Einstein. Uh, and and I, was, I was a bit surprised when I read this from his perspective. You would have thought that Albert Einstein, Albert Einstein spent so much time in solution mode. And I'm sure he did eventually. But, you know, these words here speak to that 95% of his time, he was, he was about defining and solving the problem. And I think that gives me a bit of courage, you know, in our, in our own consulting business, and it gives a lot of our customers courage that it's actually about spending the time in actually defining the problem. And then a lot of the time, the solution will come from that. A lot of the time we see when people jump straight to solution mode, they might actually have a solution and say, we're off and running, let's run with it. But, and the solution might look great on face value, but it's not solving the right problem. So I think that was just a bit of a bit of a bit of a high level um, uh, line from a from a famous guy that, that could be helpful. Now, in the time remaining, uh, we just want to. These are some of some scenarios that we had um, that we can have a bit of a conversation about. Um, in the meantime, feel free to feed to to fire through any questions um, or, or challenges in terms of some of the stuff we've talked about. Happy to have a conversation about that. Um, so let's keep an eye on any questions coming through. And the questions could be, you know, how, how can this relate to my specific sector within any infrastructure? Or a question could be how it relates to my role. So feel free to fire those through. So in the meantime, um, these are some, some scenarios that, that um, Brett and myself have had a conversation with. And as I mentioned, you know, Joe talked about um, the very beginning of when, when I caught up with him last week, you know, Let's not just get focused on just selling products. Let's look at how we can look at the overall solution set and how, how we can use the AS CDI association and the partner network within that to build those partnerships. So Brett, just briefly, so, you know, moving, moving from product com um, commodity to partnership, what are you seeing, you know, at a high level in that space in, in your own business? Oh, uh, look, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to simplify that, uh, that statement. And, mm -hmm. um, and and create an analogy that uh, that a lot of my business would not exist today if I didn't ask the question I was uncomfortable with. And uh, and I kind of it's the same feeling when you're 18 or 21 in America when you go out have a couple of beers and you're out there chasing a girl or a or a guy whatever whatever might suit. And um, you know she's there or he's there and uh, you 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 just don't have the guts to go and ask her out. And you don't know if that's going to be your wife in the future, but you're going to sit there and kick yourself if you don't know. And I think human nature, it is, it is easy to be comfortable. It is hard to be, uh, I suppose, challenging because people are scared of rejection and also being outside their comfort zone. But at the end of the day, everybody, whether it's a CIO or whether it's a CEO or whether it's, a, um, whether it's somebody that is important in industry, people are scared to face rejection instead of asking the uh, you know the, the questions that are relevant to business. So I was once a box dropper, and I saw all my competitors were box droppers. Now I'm a solution provider, a, con a consulting service provider, a managed service provider that you know is, is niche to the network. Um, a lot of that is now driven, you know, and and, and sort of thinking about the, the change in technology. Everybody now has access to cloud. I just don't think people understand how they get there. And everybody has a role in doing that. So if if the strategy and, and the discussion that you can help 
Andrew, with some of our uh, with, with some of our uh, partners here at ACDI, just put a framework in play that uh, that creates a conversation. Automatically, you've just differentiated yourself from your competition. And especially now, while we're all sitting at home and can't travel, it's a really good time to sit down and, and, and do a plan on how that box that you sell can become part of that infrastructure that plays a key role uh, to your customers in state. And it's not very long that you'll move up the top of the stack where you're talking with the application guys, with the security guys, and with the cloud guys, because everybody needs to work together. But if all you can focus on is how much you're going to make on that box, um, you become commoditized and, and your business won't last very long. So, um, you know, do I see cloud as a threat? It's an enabler. So uh, cloud is, is, is creating consumption of IT just in a little bit different way than what we were used to 25 years ago. And as soon as you see it as an opportunity, um, you, you've got to do the plumbing to get them to the cloud. And uh, people quite often don't realise that until it's too late. The amount of deals that I've done because it's been forgotten about um, is, is not the way to do business because it's luck, but you should be forefront of your customer to make sure that it isn't the last thing that's forgotten about. So I hope yep. that... Uh, I think that that provides yeah you know a brilliant example, and I think it, it answers Joe's question. You know, is cloud a threat or an opportunity? And I think that you know the, the examples you've used to date in in our chat, Brett. You know, you know people have so many defin, definitions of what cloud means. So I think it's actually being part of shaping that conversation, as you say. And I think that goes towards answering the question there: is it a threat or opportunity? I'm conscious of time. I don't, I don't want to to um, go on uh, past our time limit. Uh, and Joe, I noticed your other comment there, there, Joe, in terms of a good solution provider is a customer for life. So 100% agree that um, although that we can get some quick wins and, you know, there are opportunities there, we'll continue to get some good quick wins. If we can expand that conversation a bit broader than perhaps even what we can currently offer at the moment, I'd pro probably challenge us all to say, let's use this as an opportunity to expand our own business. And I've heard Brett talk about um, and, you know, remembering, you know, working with Brett, you know, as a senior architect back in the day, the conversations would expand firstly from just the, the, the solution at hand to what's happening, what's happening in, in the broader customer business. And I think when we do that, things start to come up in those conversations that will highlight perhaps areas we can grow our own business from a consulting or it could be you know, moving, move, moving further up the stack. So I think, I think that those points cover a lot of those questions. Uh, I'm going to wrap up um, in terms of, again, thanking uh, Joe, Brett, um, and um, Neil and Todd for, for having me here today. I think it's listening to the first hour and Corey's presentation. I got a lot out of myself. And I think, you know, the association itself in bringing people together is a huge testament to, uh, you know, challenging some of the norms and challenging what is the biggest industry headlines. And I think the fact you're doing that and you're part of it is certainly certainly a, a game changer in your sectors. Uh, we've got a we've got a couple of um, in terms of resources you can turn to. These are the Foundstone guide. There we can put them in the chat in terms of links. That's just a guide. They're, they're not sales documents. They are a, a guide that we've come up come with from a strategy perspective. And um, so feel free to da download that from our, our website. And it's talking through a couple of real live scenarios um, from from a, a business owner perspective how we can look at strategy and how we can start to have some conversations that open up new opportunities. It blends in some design thinking principles. So you might get a bit of value of, you know, you know what, what on earth is this design thinking thing about and how can it apply in the real world? So uh, hopefully those resources will, uh, will, will give you some value. So for me to finish on, I just really wanted to revisit our, our first question we proposed is how can we, be relevant, as relevant as, as possible to our end customer. And my simple answer to that is start with that conversation of defining what, what the hell the problem is. Because a lot of the time, our customers might be solving the wrong problem. And when, if we can help them to, to shift that perspective, it changes the game. So thank you uh, again for, for having me. Thank you, Andrew, greatly appreciate it. and. Um... Fantastic presentation, and I hope uh, just even for a couple of our members or, uh, or, or attendees that it will, uh, it will help change the mindset in which we speak to our customers because if we don't continually change, uh, you know, what IT was like 20 years ago versus what it is now, um, our customers will be finding our competitors uh, because they'll be doing it. 
the business is there and if a customer already trusts you, feel awkward and have that conversation uh, because you don't know where it's going to lead. If I never asked uh, that girl out at the, at the, at the <laughs> nightclub, I wouldn't have a wife. Um, so you don't know. That's you that story. <laughs> all right. So thank you very much and I look forward to uh, seeing you all in the next presentation uh, about Japan. Thank you.